Hey everyone, welcome to Beyond Film School. Happy Sunday, thanks for joining me. If you are joining me, please let me know in the chat where you are joining me from. I know I got a lot of people from all different types of places. I'm excited to get this live stream going. We are talking about leadership and film, and I will admit that I am really big on leadership, I'm really big on confidence, and those two things definitely go together hand in hand, but leadership I can totally geek out on. So if you are here <laughs> to like nerd out on leadership and film and how things are run on teams, on a film set, you are in the right place. I'm very, very excited. Let me know where you guys are joining me from. Let me know you're here. And as always in every live stream, I welcome all the questions on topic, off topic, whatever your film industry questions are, I am here for it. So let me know what your questions are. I'm always, always very, very happy to answer any of the questions because let's be honest, things in the film industry are very much mysterious. I feel like there's definitely a gate that is there <laughs> that people are like, what is it like? What's happening? I don't know enough. And I'm all about giving information. So I have Amanda joining me. Amanda is a, a channel member. Thank you so much, Amanda, for joining me and for being a channel member. Channel memberships are here for you. You get the little inside scoop. Wow, like while I have time to talk about memberships, exclusive videos, and also you have the power of having me make a video for you as a member. So if there's a topic that you're like, I have no idea about this, I can make you a video if you're a channel member. Because why not, right? So I will say, I'm gonna start off by saying, leadership is very, very important in the film industry. There are so many departments, there are so many moving parts, and if you don't have functional <laughs> and I'm you know and, and I will say I can't even say efficient leadership but if you have if you don't have functional leadership things are just not gonna go well on a film set you have to have leaders on set with you there is a lot to do and there's a big goal right so there are micro goals every day of like let's make sure we get these scenes every get these scenes every day but then the macro is we have this whole project another might be a film, music video, commercial, TV episode, whatever it is, that's the big goal, right? We're trying to finish this whole project, get it in the can, get it done, and then out for people to see. So that's the big goal, right? And then you have littler goals day by day or week by week. And there's so many different moving parts in film that each department is gonna be their own team, they're gonna have their own leaders, but then you have like, I would say the top, top, your executive leaders, and then you have the producers who are your leaders, and then of course you have the director as one of the leaders, and I will say if the director is not, if the director is definitely not a strong leader, sometimes a shoot will definitely suffer, unfortunately, but there are ways to kind of get around that. If you have stronger leaders that are surrounding the director, that usually helps a bit. So we're gonna get into a little bit of like, why leadership is important, different types of leadership, and how that kind of intermingles with filmmaking. So leadership in film happens at all levels. It's not just your top, like I said, the producers and the directors and all that. And like your director of photography is definitely going to be a leader and your gaffer and your first AD. All those folks are going to be leaders, but you have the people who are second in command, you have people who are at the bottom. Now, what I will say is this, for my set PAs out there, and Mizuki is here, thank you Mizuki for joining me. <laughs> she is a um, Beyond Film School alum, so happy she's here, thank hi Mizuki. So, and speaking about Mizuki, she's a brand new, brand new into like the union world, she's a set PA, but also like, she is a leader as well. Even though she is at the like bottom, quote unquote, bottom of the barrel, I find that people who have just joined the film industry. They just entered, they just started. Even after like a couple weeks, you can find yourself being a leader because then you can answer certain questions to a, a newer or a greener PA. Or you can set the example of like how to do this lockup, how to communicate on the walkie. Like you are setting the example for other newer folks that are joining the team. So leadership in all levels, all levels happens in film for sure. So. I wouldn't say that if you are you feel like, oh, well, I'm only a set PA, so therefore I'm not a leader. You wouldn't know how many times me, myself, as a set PA, I found myself, I wasn't the key, I wasn't, you know, running first team, or I wasn't the base camp uh, PA, and I wasn't, you know, running background, but I was still seen as a leader because I kind of, well, first of all, some people, <laughs> I will say, have a natural tendency to leadership. But with that being said, I will say that being a leader is not 
something that you can't acquire. It is a skill that you can hone and you can get better at. Because some people, I think there's that saying, like leaders are born or not, leaders are made, not born. I don't, I don't know the, but the saying, but there's like a weird saying that, you know, you are born as a leader, which this is false. <laughs> you are not born as a leader. You are kind of crafted into it based on your character traits and all of that. And you might have certain characteristics that make you a better leader or a natural leader, but this is something that you can definitely hone. You can acquire the skill, you can work on it, you can you know, figure out certain traits that are gonna be better for you to execute better leadership. So all levels, you definitely do not have to be born with leadership. And sometimes you will find yourself on a film set and you will be looked at as a leader and you wouldn't even expect it uh, because you are setting the example and you wouldn't even have to tell anyone what to do because I think sometimes leaders are seen as the people who are going to be telling people what moves to make. They're going to be delegating, they're going to be telling people what to do and they're the bosses, right? And that's not entirely true at all because I think there is really, really something to be said for people who are setting the example and you're like, wait a minute, this person is doing X, Y, Z and they're getting good feedback, therefore I'm going to start following in their steps. So being the example, being a good role model is also, definitely also part of being a leader. Uh, we have uh, Nicole joining us, also a Beyond Film School. I feel like I'm putting on like a Beyond Film School, like all my tr alumni are like joining me for this live stream. So thank you guys so much for being here with me. I feel so like, oh my God. So what is leadership? We're gonna get into what is leadership because I feel like leadership, like just think to yourself, like what exactly is leadership? Because I actually researching this and thinking about this, I'm like, you can't really put it into a nice, definition or a nice sentence you're like leadership like what is it like there's the common goal you have you know leading people to a common goal or trying to get people successful in this certain mission or there's always a lot of definition that people have and there are so many groups out there that are trying to research leadership how what the best way is leading a team and they're, they like do like a lot of human behavior. There's lots of psychology that goes into leadership and lots of case studies that go into leadership and what's the best way to lead people and how people best respond to certain leadership styles. There's a whole lot of research that goes into leadership. So this isn't something that is like, oh, like light. This is something that people look into a lot. It's very, very highly researched. So trying to define leadership keeps changing over the years because I think when immediately when people think of leadership, they, they kind of always steer toward military. And I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you guys might have the same thought. Let me know in the chat, like what you think about leadership and where it falls. Cause I, for me, like my dad was in the military, he was in the army. So for me growing up leadership, I definitely connected to military for some weird reason. And I don't know if anyone else feels that way. Also, some other people feel that leadership is connected to someone being a CEO of a, a Fortune 500 company, you know? so. Uh, thanks, David. Thanks for joining us. We got that Sunday service. That's right. <laughs> so leadership is kind of seen in a lot of different ways with a lot of different folks. And, and this is why I'm talking about the styles, because you will see when we're talking about the styles is that you will see them more than others. And then sometimes you'll see other styles and not realize that that is actually a leadership style. So it can be for me like my first association with leadership was military. And then me growing up and in high school, I was JROTC. So that was a, a, a more structured way of teaching me how to be a leader, where me just being like, you are a kid and you're like trying to organize a kickball game or something. Not that I don't think anyone plays kickball anymore. Does, do kids go outside anymore? I don't think so. I'm definitely showing my age because <laughs> I don't know if kids actually go outside. Although I will say after the pandemic, I've seen more and more kids outside. So that is good. So I will, <laughs> like, I have no idea like what kids are doing nowadays, but like when you're organizing certain things and you're like trying to make sure something happens and like you do something with your friends and you're like being a leader and you don't even know it when you're organizing certain things to do with people or your friends or whatever. So one of the bare bones definition of what a leader is, is just a person who has followers. Now this is very, very simple. And I don't know if I completely agree with a leader is just someone with followers, because I will say that there are certain people who definitely have followers and they are 
not trying to leave them. They just, you know, some people will acquire, <laughs> some people will definitely acquire some, some followers and they don't even mean to do that, right? So that is something that I find to be an interesting definition. And this is kind of like an old, maybe like an, an older definition. So maybe it's just a little bit too simple for my liking. And I think maybe in this, as far as like followers, I can't really relate that definition to a film set. Like we're not following, like I guess we would be following the director, but also like sometimes if you follow the director blindly, like they're going to lead us into the wrong direction. We're going to be not making our days and it's going to be horrible. <laughs> so that definition I don't really get down with. Now, the next definition I'm going to talk about is John Maxwell. His definition. Now, John Maxwell, if you want to look him up, I'm going to put his name in the chat because uh, he, man, I swear, like if I want to get inspired, I listen to John Maxwell. I swear to God. So John Maxwell is, sorry, I'm trying to type this and talk at the same time. So John Maxwell is a, like, he's an author, he's a former preacher, and then he does these talks about leadership and confidence and all this stuff. I love listening to his, his stuff. I do. So I find that his definition of leadership not being as adequate as I would like. It doesn't complete me, right? So his definition is leadership is influence, Right, so it's almost as simple as a leader is just someone who has followers. Now this one is just a leader is just someone who has influence. Now we all know based on the social influencers of the world that that whole like, uh, now that's kind of like breaking down now, like influencers online are really like leading you in a direction that you don't really want to be led into and you're like, wait a minute. So that is something for a leader to have influence. That is something that you, should have because you want to make sure that you are influencing your team to make the right decisions or in the right direction or whatever. So that is part of it. But I feel like as a full definition, it doesn't quite get exactly what I'm looking for. Right. So let's get into what I think maybe what I've, what I've found and I've resonated with is I'm like, okay, this definitely is a definition I can get down with. I, I full on, I'm like, yes, I totally get down with this. Okay. So what is leadership? Now, this comes from Kevin Cruz. Now, he is uh, the CEO and he's an author, Kevin Cruz, and a CEO of lead at leadx.org or something like that. But he is really, really big on leadership and he does a lot of talks and he has a lot of books on a lot of different things about how to try to make the environment of uh, employers and management and like just more efficient and better as far as like leadership goes. But the process of social influence, which maximizes the efforts of others toward the achievement of a goal. Now, that gets like, efforts, there's influence, social influence, there's, there's achievement and there's goals in there, right? So when I apply this to film, right? The, the goal for me as an AD, when I have a team of PAs, the goal for me is like, we do all the things we have to do for the day, right? Because I take it day by day or maybe like week by week. Now, if I were a director or director of photography or a producer, I would say, okay, once I have everything, once printable photography is done, that's the goal, right? Once we get everything shot, that would be another type of goal in film. So I think this is a really, really good definition. And I don't know what you guys think of this, but I think that as far as when you are a leader and when you're a leader in film, you have to think about how do we do this process most efficiently? How do I lead my team in the right direction to make sure that we get everything we need to do for the day, for the week, for the episode, for the movie, right? So the achievement of a goal, right? Getting everything shot, <laughs> maximizing efforts. Now this is where it gets really, really tricky because I have seen some things definitely on a film set <laughs> where it has not been efficient. <laughs> it has not been efficient. And it has been like, why are we doing this in such a backwards way? Now I will say that some people will complain about the schedule and why we had to do, we had to shoot this in this order and why are we here and whatever. But sometimes locations fall through. Sometimes actor availability is a thing because you have a number one actor, A-list actor, and she or he is not available because she's got to go to the Grammys or, you know, some award show, or maybe she's got to present something. So therefore she can't shoot on Wednesday and Thursday. So we have to do repeat something that we did already on Monday. have to do it Friday again. Who knows, right? So there are so many things where you're like, okay, with what we're given, we try to maximize the efforts. So we try to make sure we, we do the things most efficiently. And I think with COVID, with the pandemic happening and the amount of paperwork, the amount of paperwork that I've had to do before the pandemic. And now after that, I think 
when if there was that weird area. I don't know if anyone can kind of uh, speak to this overseas or, or in the U.S., but when COVID first started and we started to shoot back in 2021, at the end of 2020, what? At, at the end of 2020, November of 2020, I think was when shows started coming back and paper was a thing. Like we can't share paper. <laughs> we couldn't touch paper for whatever reason. We couldn't print anything. No one printed anything. And that's when like the mobile, uh, everything was like, you, we'll pay you to use your phone $3 a day. Cause if everything's on your phone, you don't have to touch the paper. So the amount of paperwork that disappeared, because of that, the pandemic has been lovely, <laughs> right? So I feel like that that efficiency now where it's like everything is like at this digital process, it kind of makes things a little bit more, we've maximized the efforts a little bit more, right? So there are things that are happening industry-wide that have helped <laughs> as far as like leadership, but that comes from producers making certain decisions because here's the thing is that producers or uh, I would say, yeah, producers, directors, I wouldn't say what directors don't really have a say in type of the admin type of how you're running a film set, but our producers and our assistant directors who are like, you know, making that decision like, hey, let's do this. Or I would say UPMs, UPMs and producers, they make those decisions where it's like, yeah, let's do this instead of this. Let's, let's do the, you know, digital vouchers or, and let's do digital call sheets and let, let's not print them out because, you know, we're wasting this and we can't have this on set anymore or whatever, right? So those are decisions made by certain leaders on set, which I really, really, I can get down with no paper. So maximizing the efforts of others so you want to make sure that you're utilizing your team in the right way, right? And I say that because, and we'll get into more of the coaching styles, but, and I think this goes into the, um, our leadership styles, I should say, but that's the coaching style. It, coaching leadership is a type of leadership style. So, and that's why, cause I was like, oh, this is, this is me coaching someone and, and trying to put someone in the right slot, right? So I'm building a team as, let's say, second AD, assistant director, we're hiring our PA team, we're hiring our staff, and we need, we need key PA, we need a uh, background runner, background helper, first team runner, first team helper, we need a uh, walkie PA, right? We need a paperwork PA, all those, all those positions. Now, if I have someone who does not like data entry, does not like being on the computer, sitting down, putting all that information in on a PR or the back of the call sheet, why would I put that person in the paperwork PA position, right? So when you're in that coaching style of leadership, the, the leadership style of coaching, like you are trying to utilize your team to put them in the best spot. So and that's something I think we're kind of like tapping into. I'll go to the leadership styles real quick because coaching is like the, I feel like that style was really good for me where I'm trying to make sure I realize the strengths and weaknesses of my team and putting them in the right spots because I'm not gonna put someone who isn't strong with people, I'm not going to put them in background runner. I'm not going to put them in, you know, as a, a, as a key where they're working with lots of departments and they're touching a lot of like people all touching people, <laughs> but they're touching all the departments and they're talking to loads and loads of people. So my least, I would say least uh, customer service bound type <laughs> PA wouldn't be in one of those key roles. Uh, maybe I might put him, put him or her in holding, or maybe I might make that person the, the paperwork PA because paperwork PAs, there's a lot of like uh, calling or texting, not a lot of face-to-face. -face, so you have to think about your team and where they will do their best. Some people don't do that, right? So these these are the type of styles of like, like you will you can be like, you know what? I want you to do this job and that's it. And you're not even considering what they're even good at. And you're just like, you have to just adjust, right? Just adjust to the position. And some, some leaders and some uh, heads of the departments will definitely do that. So getting back to, to like, what is leadership? It's kind of, <laughs> it gets kind of tricky, I feel like. And with different styles, I tend to use different combinations of leadership styles to make sure that I'm leading the team in the right way. Because here's the thing is that some people on your team are going to respond to different styles. They're not going to respond to certain things that another person would respond to, right? So I want to get into a little bit of what makes a good leader. And I love this little chart. I love this little chart. This, this is some good stuff. 
I love this. And uh, Center for Creative Leadership, I the their organization has so many things on leadership. And I, I, f- I swear to God, there's nothing associated. I don't know Kevin Cruz. I don't know any of these any of these people. I just did a lot of research, and this is what I came up with. So, I mean, take a look at this list and like think about your bosses. Think about the people who've led you on set. Did they have integrity? Integrity? Did they delegate properly? All right, were they good communicators? Were they self-aware? I think self-awareness is a huge, huge one because I, as a leader, need to be self-aware of my strengths and weaknesses. Like, for example, one of my weaknesses is definitely, sometimes I have a short fuse. If I'm stressed out, I will get angry and I have to remember to be patient. I have to be like, you know what, Amber, you're starting to get mad right now for literally no reason. You're only stressed out. So let's just make sure that I'm patient. And a perfect example, I'm gonna bring up Mizuki really quick and I'm gonna bring up the the... The uh, last set I was on, Mizuki worked with me, and let's just go to the chat. I'm going to say hi to everybody. Um, so working K9 Productions, happy Sunday, happy, happy, happy Sunday. And let's see, Amanda, for me, when I worked on set, you led the set, and, and us uh, UPAs did the best to our ability, and then some. I will be honest, I do look up to you and would like to be an AD. Oh, thank you, Amanda. Thank you for saying that. I feel like anytime I get... Now, I guess as someone who leads a team, when you get compliments or good feedback from the people above you, it's definitely different from when you get the compliments and feedback from the people who who you're leading, right? So when my PAs walk away happy from a a really hard set and they're like, Amber, we want to work with you again. We had a great time, even though it was hard. Like that is a definitely, definitely big, big win. So um, Prakash, I want to say hi before you jumped off. So thank you for joining me for a few minutes. Thank you, Prakash. and so I, I find that like when I get compliments and I receive really, really, really good feedback from the team that I'm leading, I really take that to heart. So thank you, Amanda. Uh, so uh, Nicole, I have a transformational leadership style. They are the most inspiring. Yes, this is, this is very, very true. Transformational is really good because, but the only thing with transformational, Nicole, what, what I will say is it takes time. And sometimes transformational does not have the time to be utilized on a certain sets. Those are your high, high logistics, a lot of moving parts. You ain't got no time. So transformational is a really good, I love that style as well, but it just takes time. And you sometimes won't have time to explain certain things or be like, hey, you know what? And next time do this. You won't have time to give the feedback that you need for a transformational style. So let's get back to Mizuki. So perfect example of me kind of, uh, I will say, wrangling my boss on set is Mizuki, ha- she had a real hard lockup. God bless you, Mizuki, I will tell you. <laughs> we were on 6th Avenue and we were shooting a motorcycle going down a block in the middle of the street. We had traffic lockups and my main concern was making sure that no pedestrians were crossing the street where the motorcycle, you know, where the intersections were. Because if they stepped into seat, uh, they stepped into the street, then motorcycle could hit them and then motorcycle driver could crash. Like a whole bunch of things could have happened if pedestrians walked into the street. Well, Mizuki was on the corner of 6th Avenue and 54th. Really, she really literally gave her the hardest lockup. And she got on the walkie and she started to tell me about the bicycles coming down. And she doesn't know this, but Rob, <laughs> her first AD, starts like, why is she, why is she on one? Why is she, because he's stressed out because of the nature of the the lockup and the shot that we had to get, it was really it was a crane shot. It was very, very complicated. We didn't have a lot of time to lock it up to make sure we got this shot. It was a very high pressure situation for him, so I understood. So he says this to me, and I was like, she's trying to tell us something important about her lockup. It is, and like, this is regarding to safety, so it needs to be on one. She's telling us about bicycles coming down the, the sidewalk and, and if she has to stop them as well, which the answer was yes. But he was getting stressed out, and I had to remind him, I'm like, make sure you, like, you have to have patience for her to get this sentence out so she can explain herself. So that's just something like where I I make sure that also like the team around me who are also helping me lead the team that we have certain patients and we don't start to, start to lose our shit under those high pressure situations. So yeah, Mizuki, thank you for killing it. By the way, everyone, shout out to Mizuki. <laughs> So um, when I hear leadership, I imagine the person who thinks 10 steps ahead and calculate every aspect of situation logically and and make a firm decision. This is very, very true. I I like that you're saying that because this kind of gets into like the thing is, and I, and I definitely have asked this from my leaders who are leading me. And, and I've had this conversation with other, with uh, my first AD and 
he'll want to say, what do you think of this? Where that leadership style is more coaching or democratic, right? So getting to the leadership styles, when, when, you're, when your boss or your, you know, department head goes, you know, what do you think of this? That, that's like more democratic, you know? And it might be bureaucratic, but if you're bureaucratic, you're like, they'll take your, they'll say, hey, what do you think? And then they won't really implement any changes. They'll just, they're trying to like, uh, give you like a little carrot. They're like a little like, hey, we 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 care what you think, but not really. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you you feel like you are heard, but you're not really. You know, it, nothing changes from whatever you're suggesting, unfortunately. So when he's asking me, hey, what do you think about this? And in the moment, I need someone who who is going to decide something. So I'm like, tell me what you need. Whereas like, I will do the thing you tell me to do. So sometimes I need more structure and I need more autocratic. Like autocratic is like. This is going to be the thing I need you to do. You do what I say and that's it. And sometimes I need that as someone who is, you know, under underneath certain leaders where they make they they make a very very definitive decision. They're like, "We're going to do this." And sometimes you definitely need that out of a leader. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you really need to get like the vibe of the group or what should we do? But in film, there is little room for a vote. <laughs> right? There's not that much time to go over what everyone thinks is best. So, and that is, that definitely is the democratic style where it's like, Hey, what do you guys think of this? And that's sometimes you definitely don't have time for that. You're definitely going to find times on set where, Hey, what do you think about like, and we have to roll in five minutes. <laughs> we don't have time for the, Hey, what do you think? Like you, you need to make a decision. And this also is something to keep in mind for those who want to be directors or when you are working with directors, where is if a director is caught up in their vision and they're caught up in their creative and they can't decide what they want to do next or what shot's going to be next or what the blocking could be where I have definitely forced my director in a corner as a first AD and been like, Hey, I need you to decide this. Like, like I need to get their focus. I'll say, hey, look at me really quick. Like, just this is what's happening. I need this or this. And I give them one option and I say, pick one of the two because I can't make that creative decision. You know what I mean? Like, that could be a matter of like, are we going to go in for a medium two shot or are we going to go for a close up? Like, I need to tell the camera so they can move while you're thinking about whatever you're thinking about with this actor. So making decisions is actually something that is very, very good to bring up. I, I love that you brought that up for sure. So going back to integrity now, I, man, I am sure, I am sure of it that you've had these leaders that are above you and you're like, what did they just say? What did they just do? Like they are not honest. They're kind of trying to get, get away with certain things, you know, leading their team, or maybe they're trying to do something to the budget or spend too much money in something thing that they was selfish on there and that they wanted that wasn't really best for the movie or, you know. Something that they, like, I see this a lot with uh, the DP and the, not really the DP, but maybe the producers and the DP who are like, you know what I want to do? Like, I want to, like, use this brand new camera that no one knows how to use, but, like, they can brag about how they use this new camera on their movie. It's not really cost efficient. No one knows how to use it, but it's, like, there is a very selfish decision, and you're like, I don't think that was the best call. And, you know, maybe they might have lied about how much that camera was worth or whatever, or how much it was to rent. And then, you know, they rent the camera and then the UPM's like, wait a minute, this rental is not what you said it was. Or then you get other leaders who, the, the director of photography who's, who will put in a budget for their camera gear and whatever, and then last minute change it up the day before shooting, where that's not really, that's not a lot of integrity. Like you're, you're trying to get by, you're trying to get one over on, you know, the people who, who are controlling the money, which is like, you know, film is money guys like it takes a lot of money to make movies i'm sorry it takes a lot of money <laughs> to make movies whether it's in wage equipment uh food like it's there like it everything costs something the fact that you are there as a set pa on <laughs> set you being there is costing money so you better like do the best job you can because you're like everyone's important and that's something that i will say and this has nothing to do with leaders but Set PAs are super important. And I think a lot of set PAs are like, oh, I'm not important. Like we, we are paying for you to be here. Therefore you are important. So let's like make the most of it. Okay. Like everyone. And I have a, a series coming out on my channel that covers the office and the production office at the, the office PAs, UPM, all that stuff that no one really talks about or knows about. 
And the UPMs I, that I interviewed, they're, off, they're the authors of Keys to the Production Office. Now, if you are trying to get into the office and have no idea what to do in the office, and I swear to God, this, I, this is not a plug or anything. I just thought about this because we're talking about leaders. But if you're trying to get into the office, this book is like so detailed. I, I, can't, even, I can't even get over how detailed it is. But uh, I know one of my online course trainees, like he got the book and he's working in the office and he's like, I feel confident. Like I, <laughs> I know, I know it, but talking to those ladies, I got to interview them and them talking about their team and talking about like the things that cost money and them saying like every person that we hire that does cost a, like a fair amount of money, but every single person that we hire is there for a certain task, a certain mission, a certain goal or whatever. And it, Every single person is important. So the leaders, the, the, the leaders of the set, which the set PAs, the producers, the gaffers, the, every single person is super important. And I think those two ladies that I got to interview that are essentially, they're pretty big leaders being UPMs. Being a UPM, you are a very, very idle role. You're an, a very, like you are like one of the top leaders of a film set and for them to be like every person's important that gives that extra something for them because I feel like when I tell my team that they're important that gives them a little bit of of empowerment and lets them know that they are important to me right they're not just some cog in the machine like you are important to me as a team member you know so I feel like that's super important for a leader to say that yes, I respect you and you are part of my team. And this is part of this, what makes a good leader, like respect, empathy, like and having courage too, I think is a really, really good one. Because as a leader, you're going to have to make certain decisions that are not easy. And it might be having to let a team member go. That's just not good for your team, unfortunately. Like letting someone know, hey, like, I don't want to tell you that you did a really horrible job this day, but here's how we can fix it. Like it takes a backbone to be a good leader. You need a backbone and you can't be afraid to say the hard things. So integrity is such a really good one. Like I love the fact that integrity is number one on this list because it's honesty and just having like some type of dignity in yourself as a person, which is, I just, I love that. So delegation is, I think, I don't know if this is an order of importance, I don't think it is, but I think all these are equally what makes a good leader. So talking about delegation, delegation is so important as a leader and having to not just empty your plate of all the responsibilities that you have to fulfill as whatever position you're in in film, but making sure that you're giving tasks to the, the team members in your department that they can handle, right? They like you're not gonna give a green PA and say, "Hey, can you get this actor ready in base camp?" They're not gonna know what to do. <laughs> so you want to make sure you're delegating the right people for the right things, right? And and I think that a lot of people don't think about it that way. It's like I'm just gonna give away all these things, but also you delegate tasks so you can free yourself up for certain more important tasks that they don't handle on their team. Like when like like for example. Uh, as an AD, uh, they're not going to be talking to the director of photography. So I'm freeing myself up like, hey, I need someone to do, go and do X, Y, Z while I go and talk to this person about this next shot so we know what's you know going to move next. So <clears throat> delegation is super important. Just knowing who to put with those certain tasks that you need to implement, right? So number three, communication. I mean, I feel like communication is number one in film. Point blank, period. Communication, if there is no communication, things don't run, basically. There is no way to make sure we're all on the same page. So being a clear communicator as a leader on a film set, I feel is like, should be number one. I mean, but also like respect and honesty and like having some type of integrity is definitely like, I can't boot that off number one either. But communication for film as a leader is... It's just, <laughs> without it, we are nothing, I think, especially for the AD department and for producers and for a UPM. And if you can't tell your team what you need to get to the end goal of making the day or making that shot happen or making the project, you know, make sure it's shot, you can't communicate what the needs are, then they can't fulfill the needs, right? 
So I think something that goes with communication is making sure that no one's confused. Now, in film, things will change over and over again. <laughs> things will change by the minute, by the hour, by the day, by the week. Like, hey, I thought we were doing this thing next. And that was like a half hour ago that we said that. Oh, well, that location just pulled out on us. So now we have to do something else. Or maybe there's lightning in the area. Now we have a 30 minute delay and we have to go for a rain cover scene. Like so many things change. And as those things change, the people that are leading your sets have to communicate those changes to make sure there is no confusion. And communication is, clear communication is, I'm not gonna say it's, it's just vital. I was gonna say it's, it's sometimes clear communication on certain sets are very, I don't want to say it's rare. I hate saying that because I feel like I'm, I'm going into like the negative <laughs> where sometimes there are some people who are just not good communicators. They may talk too much or they may just be bad on the walkie. Therefore, their message just didn't come across on the walkie, you know, so they are not concise. Maybe they are too short with you and you're like, okay, you didn't say enough for me to understand what is happening, right? So maybe they didn't use enough words. There are so many different things about communication. Also, it's how you say things. If I say something to you with an angry tone, you are less susceptible to receive that message. You're just like, why is this person angry at me? Because it will be startling. Or if I am timid and I'm not having enough confidence when I'm trying to communicate certain things, no one's gonna believe that message you just said. So it's also what you're saying is a factor, but it's how you say it that is also a part of communication. And am I too loud? Am I too quiet? Like the physicality of it, like using certain volumes, like, you know, some people will be distracted by, you know, certain things that you're saying. Maybe you like to be funny, which this is definitely my thing. I like to make jokes. I like to be funny. <laughs> but if I'm being funny and I'm trying to give you a message, you think I'm joking. Maybe you didn't think that was the thing you were supposed to do because you're like, oh, I thought you were joking. I didn't know you were serious. So it's all about how you're saying it and the tone that you're using when you're using communication in film. 100%. I'm going to go to the chat. Let's see what we got. Let's see what we got. Um... <clears throat> Prakash left us. Respect should be number one or number two. Or number two. <laughs> I love Nicole. She's like, number one or number two. <laughs> so you're like, this is why I can't really put this. I can't really put this in like a, 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 an order from least to, uh, least to most or what's mo more important or not. Like, I can't really do that, unfortunately, because I, I feel like they're definitely equally. I mean... What would you guys put as number one? I feel like integrity and respect would probably, I feel like that goes together though, to be honest with you, like integrity and respect kind of go together. I feel like that's number one, that's definitely number one. And then the second one would definitely be communication. If I were to make this list, if I were to make this list 100%. I'm gonna go to the chat really quick. Uh, that's why everyone, that, that, that is why we, uh, th that is why we, everyone comes to, uh, that's why, there we go, there we go. Um, you respect her. Oh, thank you so much, Nicole. I'm trying, I'm like skimming through. <laughs> thank you so much, Nicole, thank you. All right, we got. So communication, very, very, very important. Now, self-awareness, I talked a little bit about self-awareness. Now, this is very important and I feel like this is rare. This, this one is definitely rare. When you talk about self-awareness, you making sure that you know your strengths and weaknesses. Uh, my strength, gosh, my strength as a leader? God, I didn't, wasn't expecting myself to ask myself this question during this live stream. Now I feel like I'm put on the spot. I put my own self on the spot. What is happening? So self-aware, like my weakness, definitely. My anger, short fuse when I'm stressed out, right? Not being patient, making sure I remind myself to be patient to make sure I don't get angry, right? Also, I think sometimes I give a little bit too much empathy for people who I'm closer to. So that is something that I'm like, like right now, I'm like just realizing, like if you have worked with me before and we've, we have a history where we have been on the same team or for example, me moving up to be an AD and then now I'm an AD, but then I still have friends who are PAs and they're working with me. So now I'm like, ah, oh, like now I have a little bit more, they, I give too much grace for people that are on my team over and over again, where I have, sometimes I have to make sure that I stay a little bit more strict and a little bit more, give more structure. So that is a, another weakness of mine where it's like, I need to make sure that I do not give too much benefit of the doubt or too much grace for people who just, cause I know them, you know? So being self-aware, and this is something I do in my classes, my set PA classes, where I say, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Because a lot of people, 
don't know what their strengths and weaknesses are. Number one, it's, it's, people are going to ask you that in an interview at least a dozen times in your life. <laughs> I don't know how many interviews you're going to be on, but you're going to get interviewed and they're going to be like, hey, what are your strengths and weaknesses? And I just got asked this on an interview that was like, you know, Thursday, I think I had, like, yeah, I had two interviews for one job. So it was like, I had the producer and then I had the director the next day. But like, that was something that he asked me, like, you know, what is something that you find that is, wh where's your strength as an AD? And I was like, oh, well. <laughs> and like, what is my weakness as an AD? And I, I told them, told him exactly this. I was like, hey, like me as assistant director, like I, the, the fact that this type of movie is more play style, more an actor's type movie where there's a lot of dialogue and the scenes are super long, <laughs> where it could be five, 10 pages of dialogue, where I think, logistically speaking, we might do masters of certain scenes. So keep the camera in the same place. We do a, a day of masters, right? For certain scenes. But that means to me that I can't check anything off. And as an AD and someone who makes checklists, I live for those checks, okay? I can't wait to check something off and write done over a scene. And the fact if we do a lot of shots over three days, I can't check anything off. I told him, I was like, that's going to give me a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> and I told him that's more me. That's more like inside me. And like, I don't express that openly to people who are working around me, but that is something he also was like, oh, I'm the same way. So that is like me being self-aware of like, that will make me a little bit nervous, make me, make me feel like I'm not actually getting anything done, but we are actually getting something done. Because I just love when I can complete a scene. If I can just check that, or check it off, oh, I love it. So being self-aware, knowing your strengths and weaknesses, and getting back to the training where I ask people what their strengths and weaknesses are, where... As long as they write them down and they, they sometimes people, I have people share, if they want to share with the class, they can totally share it, but I don't force anyone to share their strengths and weaknesses because that's some deep, some deep ass shit, right? That's some <laughs> deep stuff that I'm asking you to share with a whole bunch of strangers that you just met like maybe yesterday uh, or like a couple hours ago or something. So when I ask them and they write it down and they, and then they tell the group, it makes it more real, but also it makes it so it's not being held over you. So a lot of people who have certain fears and worries, if you just like say, you know what, I'm worried that I'm going to be unemployed for the next year because of the writer's strike. And I feel like once it's out, it doesn't like weigh on you so much. So if you are admitting your weaknesses as a leader, it's like, you know what, I am prone to be angry and I will flip out if this happens. It's like it doesn't stay in you. It doesn't like weigh you down as long as you are aware of it it doesn't have power over you anymore. Like once you're aware and your consciousness is like, yo, I'm totally aware that I could get angry. It's like, then you figure out the solutions to make you better. And then you start like getting into more of your strengths and how to like battle your weaknesses. So being self-aware, that, that's a whole exercise that leaders should be doing. Every leader, if you are a leader in a leadership role, head of department, if you are a key in a department, or you're just maybe like, you know that you, people look up to you. And that, and that, that kind of falls into that definition of you have followers, right? Where you know people are following you on set. That you are, maybe you might be an everyday additional PA on a set, but people are like, they look up to you. They ask you questions. And it's like, you know the things. It's like using that, making sure like, I am a leader and I need to be, this is what I need to be better at. And this is what I need to work on. It's a whole exercise. Being self-aware, I encourage everybody. Like, just look up Google, like, how to be more self-aware. There are, like, exercises, practices, books you can read, all about it. Like, seriously. And this, I feel like being self-aware kind of taps into a person's dark side. And I've had, like, there's a whole bunch of stuff about your shadow side, your dark side, the things that make you a bad person, right? Things that are, like, just not, that, that make you just not good, right? And, and me, like me indulging in my anger. As soon as I admitted that to myself, that I love being angry. <laughs> now this is getting a little personal with me, but like the fact that I talk about, like I love being angry. Angry, it, being angry is a very indulgent thing. And it is a vice for a lot of people. As soon as I admitted that to myself, my, I guess, bursts, outbursts of being angry or the amount that it occurred happened at least 75% less. Once I was like, I love being angry. Like, and I'm not angry anymore. I am so calm now. I don't know what happened. It's the craziest thing when you admit the things that you don't want to admit to yourself. So being self-aware is so valuable to you as a person, not even just as a leader, 
Just being self-aware. I think that's, that's a really good one. Not even just for leaders, just being self-aware. Who are you? What makes you a bad person? What are you afraid of? Admit those things to yourself and they don't really have a power over you anymore. It won't control you as a person. So going on to gratitude, which is a really, really good one. Gratitude is amazing. And I always, 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 I lead from a place of gratitude every day. I, th- I thank <laughs> the gods, <laughs> what I'm thankful for <laughs> every day. I am thankful for so many different things. I am thankful for the new job I got to, to, to do as a key second last week. I am thankful for all the PAs that did such a good job. I'm thankful for giving people jobs when I can, when I can hook up my, you know, a BFS alum with certain jobs and stuff. I am thankful for so many things. And I know it is very, very hard for some people to be like, what am I thankful for? What do I got to be thankful for? You can be thankful that you woke up this morning and you open your eyes. Okay, (laughs) I know sometimes people are dealing with depression and they are dealing with so many different hard things in their lives. They're dealing with deaths or dealing with people, you know, breaking up with you or, you know, strange whatever. There's so many things that are happening. Like, like, listen, I know there's a lot of things happening in the world. There's like war and hate and there's such crazy shit that's happening. But there's always something you can be grateful for. And I think as a leader, if you lead from a place of gratitude, your team will also lead in your, like will also follow in your footsteps and lead others that are around them with gratitude. Like gratitude, I feel like is such a fast growing thing that it is so, I don't know, like it's like a, gratitude can really be euphoric and it can spread really fast and it's very, very nice. It's contagious. Gratitude is lovely. So if anyone has any thoughts about gratitude, man, like, tell me in the chat, what are you grateful for? Because I'm just grateful to be here right now. <laughs> so, but gratitude is super important. And I feel like I keep saying every, every one of these is super important, but gratitude is very, very important to just make sure you're leading your team in the right direction with a good vibe, with a good tone. Are you thankful you're, that for your team? You know, like, I always want to make sure throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout whatever it is, that we just did that hard lockup. Thank you so much. At the end of a day, I say thank you so much for the PAs. You guys, you guys did a really great job. Uh, regardless of all the, the hiccups that, that you might have had, regardless of the challenges you might have faced that day or that week or whatever, I want to make sure that I am thanking my team in some way. I am grateful. Because here's the thing, is that your team doesn't necessarily have to do what you tell them to do. Because I think that is something about leadership where it's like, I tell you to do something, you do it, right? That's kind of the thought process with leadership. They don't have to. Like, yes, there's being, they're being paid to do a job, but also you can't force anyone to do anything that they don't wanna do. So the fact that they did the things you needed to do when you delegated certain tasks to them, or you know, they did it well, they did it efficiently, they did it quickly, they did it like better than you thought they, that you could, that you could think that they could do it. So. Being grateful, having a sense, like just a good sense of gratitude is so good for your team. It just makes everyone feel better, first of all. (laughs) Like really, honestly. Let me go to the chat really quick. Amanda, let's see. Also, when someone sees potential and you said AD or UPM will be hard on you because they, as a leader, want you to succeed and see you achieve your goals. Yes, this is very true. Now, this, I, I haven't really outlined anything about tough love, Amanda. And I think that's probably what you're going for, right? Tough love. Because here's the thing is that like some people, like I said, will respond to certain leadership styles and not respond to other leadership styles. Where for me, I said earlier that I respond sometimes to really strict structure type leadership style, which is like autocratic, where just tell me what you want, I'll do it and I'm gonna rock it, right? That's that's sometimes what I need. It's kind of funny that I have a very rebellious type personality where I'm like, don't tell me what to do, but also sometimes I need someone to tell me what to do. (laughs) So it's like kind of weird and like this weird duality or paradox or if you will or whatever. But when someone says, hey, you you like really fucked up and you did this thing, like don't let it happen again. It's like, oh Christ. Okay, because sometimes other leaders will not have the courage to do that where it's like, hey, don't fuck up and don't do this thing ever again. And they'll just, some, some leaders will definitely just not have the courage to say it to you and just not address it. And then you're like, I know I messed up, but I don't really know how I messed up, but no one's given me any type of feedback and no one's told me anything. That happens a lot where you got fired from a job and you have no idea 
why you were fired from that job. You have no idea, right? And that happens so much. And that is because someone lacked courage to tell you what's what. Or <laughs> they lack the time and empathy either. I mean, I'm going to go with they lack the time and the empathy. And they don't, they don't really care. They're like, we just have to move on. Which that type of lack of empathy really does kill a team. And it's like gives the filmmaking industry such a bad rap. Like 100%. So, okay, we're going to get into Nicole. She's grateful, supportive family. So that we're in my corner when I change careers. Grateful for being led to be a... Yes. I, like, that is something, a supportive family. Yes, not everyone has that. So the fact that you are grateful for that is, like, so good. Like, really, like, honestly, because some, some people will have supportive families. Mine, like, my mom will probably slap me right now. <laughs> what I'm about to say, she's like, excuse me, Amber. <laughs> but for the longest time, when I was trying to really get into film... They're like, when are you going to settle down? When are you going to get, like, a real job? When are you going to, like, you know, it's not, this isn't working. This isn't, like, when are you going to, you can do weddings, Amber. You can do this. this. I was like, uh, no. Like, I'm just, I got to focus. I'm going to definitely, film is going to be my thing. I swear it's going to be my career. I swear, I swear. Like, I struggled. And there was definitely some doubt. So, like, the fact that you're grateful for a supportive family is amazing. So, like, if you have a supportive family, definitely be grateful for it. Like, please. My, my family is supportive now. I mean, they let me do what I had to do. They, they let me make my own mistakes, which I think I had to make, actually. So, like, my family, very grateful for my family as well. So, learning agility. I like to say that you are never done learning. And I think this is very true for leaders. And if you feel like you have, sto you have stopped learning then I feel like life isn't fun anymore. There's not a day that, the, like, that... There's not a day that goes by where I'm not learning something or I'm not experiencing something new or acquiring some new skill or, hey, I didn't know I could do this. Perfect example is me learning how to do a call sheet in Word. Now, in the U.S., now this might be, this might be something that no, I, like, <laughs> no one has any idea, but AD is making call sheets. In the U.S., we do it with Excel. We do it with formulas and all this lovely stuff we can, you know, we do it all in Excel. Now, this show that we just did came from Canada, and we had to use their template to make sure it matched and, like, the production company had it, whatever. And I had to make a call sheet in Word, and I had never made a call sheet in Word ever in my life. <laughs> so... I spent some time and I like learned how to make a call sheet in Word. <laughs> so being agile and learning new skills and learning just like new, like everything really. Like I think in film, there's always new equipment. There's always some new shot someone wants to try. There's always some new method or practice that someone wants to try on a film set. So as a leader, you will keep learning. And I think you need to make it your mission to keep learning. And also, when you learn things about your team and your team members, right? It's, for example, like I know if a certain team member is more quiet, where if I've learned that about them, where I, okay, like, so now I know they respond to this and figuring out, oh, this one, they talk too much. So now I know how to manage them. So learning things about the people that you're leading is also part of that learning agility and kind of maybe embracing different styles for different people and i think like that really goes into like learning it could be learning skills learning new things about yourself learning like learning agility i think covers all the bases everywhere so so <clears throat> influence being the next one if you have no influence no one is going to follow you <laughs> so if you if you are not ha if you don't have any influence over your team it's not really going to be a good time. <laughs> like, and I'm sure you've definitely been on those film sets, those teams, works, jobs, whatever, where you have a boss and no one really listens to them, but they listen to like either the second in command or, you know, the person who is the, you know, maybe the supervisor or something and not really the top, top. You're like, I don't listen. I don't know what that guy's doing. Like you don't, for whatever reason, you don't want to follow them. That means I have no influence over you. You are not, you're not really into doing what they say or do. Because <laughs> sometimes the person at the top isn't the best example 
for the role model of whatever position it could be. Like it could be a prop master and you're like, that guy is lazy. Or it could be the first AD that's a screamer AD. And you're like, that guy sucks. He's an asshole. <laughs> you know what I mean? So having influence over your team is very important as well. It's just like, it, it's what is going to make you a good leader because if you have influence over your team, they're going to do the things you want them to do and they're going to do it well. If you have influence over your team, they're going to want to impress you. And if they want to impress you, they're going to do the tasks that you want them to do more efficiently. They're going to do it because they want to for you. And that is what I, I really, I don't want to say stress in myself when I'm leading my teams, but if I make them feel so empowered that they want to do good for me and make me look good, that's the best place you want to be because that makes your job so much easier, so much easier when you have influence over your group. And I feel like influence is almost a dirty word where it seems like, oh, you have to manipulate somebody and you can't, I don't know, it just seems, it seems very like evil almost <laughs> and they, like because you get into words of like seduction persuasion manipulation when it, but influence could go very well or can go really bad where you could influence a team to do horrible things where i've seen whole teams of you know pas or ad's treat all the background like complete garbage right but then like you have a, a different ad where they're like no these are people we respect them and then it's like same team different ad but then like wait a minute, it's, it, you've influenced that whole team to treat the background way better, right? So the influence can go either way. So I don't want to put influence as in it's bad because I, I think that it, just the word influence alone has a very negative connotation to it and I don't want it to be because you can use your influence for good, guys. <laughs> you can totally use your influence for good. So moving on to empathy. This is something I really had to learn as a leader and I almost felt like in film, you couldn't really show your emotion. You couldn't really be a person. You can't really have, you know, anything that's going to show you being human. And we're all human. And I think that because we work in film for so long, because there's so many long hours and there's so many things you have to do and it's a long project and I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted by the chat right now. I will go to the chat in a minute after I talk about empathy. <laughs> but there are so many things I had to learn about, first of all, myself and film where though, like where I was as a person, my personality and how that meshed with how film production meshed, right? Like how I was going to be myself, but also in the confines of how film, the film industry run, had run, runs, right? So empathy was a big one for me as a leader because I was very strict and I was like, I didn't care like how you felt or if it was hard or if you cried, but even though I'm like stressed out crying over whatever job I just had as a first or <laughs> me and the producer are like screaming at each other for whatever reason, like I had zero empathy for my team. I just wanted them to like step up, do the job. And that was it. And I learned, I guess maybe the hard way and probably through a number of different productions where it's like, that was not how I was going to get the best out of my team. Uh, just kind of being like, fuck feelings, just do the job. That does not get the best out of your team at all. And empathy was something where I was like, okay, there are things that are going to happen in people's lives. People all don't process emotions the same. Uh, people are more sensitive. Some people aren't, aren't as sensitive. So just learning people was definitely my <laughs> learning curve. And the ability for me to learn that as a leader was good. And it was a good thing that I was self-aware enough to be like, Amber, learn more about empathy to be a better leader. <laughs> and I went from, I think, it, like years ago, a couple years ago, where I had massive turnover. Like all the PAs kept quitting on me because I was so harsh. I was just so harsh. I was like, you just have to do it. But now it's like people want to be on my team. So I feel like I've made a 180. And I think part of that, like admitting mistakes is also part of being a good leader for sure. And I think a lot of people have to have the courage to admit their mistakes. And <clears throat> that goes into the next one, courage. But empathy is so important as far as just you are working with humans. And I think with the hours of the film industry, 12 hours, 16 hours, I just worked 16 and a half hours on Tuesday, which is absolutely nuts. Like we're doing superhuman things. It's crazy, right? And then 
on top of that, some people who are lugging equipment, like hour after hour, like the, 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 the physical demands for people in film is crazy. And the fact that I did not have empathy for my team who are working in film is absolute bananas. I look at it now, I look back, and I'm like, what, is, what was wrong with you, Amber? So I find empathy to be very much lacking in the film industry. But the great thing about it is that it's coming more and more prevalent in film. And I see it more and more with more department heads and more departments that I'm working with. And I just feel like there are more people who want to actually stay in film now. Because so many people I've encountered where they just were treated harshly and they were just like, no, if you can't do the job, just go and whatever. And then they quit and they just never worked in the industry ever again. And that's so sad. I hate that. And um, a fellow YouTuber, that happened to her. And she was a script supervisor. And she just like, no, I had a horrible experience over and over and over again. And no one cared about X, Y, and Z. So I just quit. And that was largely because it was a lack of empathy. It's literally that. <laughs> just a lack of empathy. And it sucks. So I think that Oh, let me, let me go to the chat really quick. There's some things happening. Okay, let's see. <laughs> um, yo, Coco, uh, sorry, Nicole. I call you Coco and Nicole. I'm so sorry. <laughs> if you stop learning, you stop growing, be a sponge. This is true. I think that if you do stop learning, it's like, I'm sorry, my brain's not stimulated anymore. And a lot of people are like, fuck school. A lot of people, that the, the school is like weird, right? So when they get out of the school, they're like, they never want to touch a book again. They never want to go through any type of courses or classes <laughs> because of what they experience in school. But I really encourage you, you can learn in a lot of different ways. So don't stop learning because you want to keep growing. And you can learn and do certain things and to learn in different ways. It doesn't have to be like some weird, like structured school thing, you know, like, so there's a lot of ways to learn and it's not always like the school way. So I want to encourage everyone to just like keep, keep learning. And it's just about, about people, about the world around you, about film. I mean, you can learn by videos, books, other people going to like seminars, all different types of things. Okay. So Rob Tierney guys is on, well, I don't know if he's still watching now, but he had a question. Who influenced you when you started in production? I, oh God, who influenced me? That's a hard question I have to think about. But um, I think my influence, man, because I feel like looking at the word influence is so hard for me for some reason. Okay, I'm going to get back to that question. I'm going to think about it for a little bit. Um, have the courage as a leader to say I was wrong, my bad. And this is, so I will totally address that, Nicole, because that's a really good, that is so good about admitting your mistakes. And I will be the first one to be like, oh shit, that was totally me. And especially when, an AD will get mad at a PA and like I was overseeing that PA and I will, and they'll start attacking the PA and I'm like, no, no, no. Like, this is me. Like I led them astray. Like I, <laughs> I almost want to do all I can to protect the PA <laughs> from the other AD that's about to like, just like kill the PA for whatever mistake they made. And I'm like, no, that was me. And then as soon as I admit that to, to whoever it was, they're like, they calm down and they like, cause I, they feel like they can't attack me cause I'm an AD. So it's like, I protect the PA. <laughs> but with the AD, it's like at me as an AD, like if I do something wrong and then I, and like a PA will catch my mistake. First of all, thank you for catching my mistake. Thank you for catching it. And then also like, Yes, that was my bad. I'm so sorry. Like, I, apologizing for your mistake. Some people find admitting mistakes to be a weakness. Now, what I will say, if there was a mistake that was made and no one noticed it, <laughs> some people like to admit the mistake that no one noticed and we're like, no one even, like, don't, like, you don't have to kind of throw yourself under the bus and make yourself look bad. Like, but if it's a known mistake and people are like, hey, how did this happen? And then you step up and say, hey, this was I, me. That was my bad. I'm so sorry. And that's definitely happened where it's like, fuck, I fucked up. Like, for sure. Because I think sometimes when you admit to a mistake and someone's very angry about whatever that thing, ha like that thing that happened or whatever got fucked up. And then you're like, I'm so sorry. I, you know, I won't happen again. I'm sorry. I did this thing. They, they, for whatever it is, they just, the, the anger just comes down at least 50%. They're like, all right, at least there's some accountability. When you are accountable, ah, oh, it's so good. There is nothing 
better when someone is accountable for their actions. When they messed up and they admit their mistakes and they're like, yo, I did this thing. I am sorry. I will fix it for the next time. Accountability is so great. I love it. It's very underrated. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, let me know what you think. Is it underrated or overrated? I'm not sure. But either way, I feel like being accountable, great, great stuff. <clears throat> All right. Go on, Mizuki. Um, Fuck feelings, let's do a job. If not, go home is my money. Mizuki, okay, so here's the thing about Mizuki. It's like, she's so hardcore. <laughs> and that's why I love Mizuki. But also, this might be your weakness, Mizuki, where you are not empathetic to the human, like, nature. Like, you have to make sure you educate yourself on empathy. So, and I, I definitely, I led from a place of fuck feelings, and it did not, it doesn't go very well. Like, some people are very, like, and the, it, it, it does sometimes it just doesn't doesn't gel at least for me it does it didn't work because everyone was like fuck amber we don't want to work for her and i, I didn't want to have a team like that so it can go definitely either way i'm like who inf i'm still thinking about rob's question i'm definitely still thinking about that all right so oh wait let me go back something came up so <laughs> be accountable it takes courage and it's great quality to have thanks amber for talking about it. thanks so much rob <laughs> So courage, right? I, a number of things that came up for courage, like saying the hard things, making the hard decisions. Uh, also, sometimes making the decisions that no one else wants to make is also part of that whole thing where you're like, everyone's kind of like, uh, no one wants to pull the trigger. You know, they're like, oh, well, I don't want to. Uh. So making those hard decisions in the co time constraints that are actually happening in film is also another thing. So Courage is another thing. Giving that bad feedback. Maybe you have to fire someone. And this is a situation I, I hate that this happened. So I won't say what show it was. I won't say what who it involved. But once upon a time, I worked on a show. <laughs> and our paperwork PA was not very great. She, we Everyone fought with her. No one got along with her. Um, people were like very, very annoyed with her. The, the way she operated as a paperwork PA. And one day in the morning... ADs go, hey, just so you know, we had a meeting. First of all, I was pissed that they didn't have me on that meeting because they're like, we wanted you to sleep. And I was like, because I had an early call time. And I was like, I appreciate you appreciating my time for sleep. But also I should be on that meeting because I was an AD too. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> so they had a meeting. And then their thing to me was, hey, this paperwork PA will now be fired. And I said to them, okay, who is their replacement? And they didn't have an answer. So I was like, y'all are dumb for trying to fire someone and you have no backup plan. Who's going to do the PR? Who's going to do all the things that that paperwork PA does? Right? So they wanted to fire this paperwork PA. But the person that wanted her fired didn't want to be the one to fire her. And I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> like, you want this person fired, but you don't have the balls to fire them yourself. So either way... I advocated for this PA, even though everyone like was very much annoyed. I was like, we have not a lot of time left on this production. Let's keep her in the, in the position. It's going to be fine. We'll, I'll manage her and we'll try and figure out a way to make this work for the next couple weeks. She didn't get fired. Thanks to me, by the way, she has no idea this whole thing happened. She has no idea that I was like, don't fire her. But also I think if it was, if I was like, okay, yeah, let's fire her. I think they would have made me be the one to fire her because I'm always the one they're like, Amber, do the hard stuff. They, like, for some reason, I can stomach certain things or give the bad news and they didn't want to do it and they didn't have the courage to do it. If you want to make that type of decision, <laughs> you better have the courage to can implement it, okay? So courage is a huge one. It's a huge one for being a good leader. And some leaders definitely do not have courage. It is very rare. <laughs> Empathy and courage, very rare with good leaders. I'm just saying. And my last one, respect. I mean, this goes without saying. Respect every single person on that crew. Background, PAs, producers, the director, the writer, the, the guest of the director, the producer's assistant, whatever it is. If they are on that set, you respect them. I don't care who you think they are or aren't. We're all human beings. We're all trying to just make this thing happen. And we're all trying to just like survive <laughs> and be happy while doing this crazy filmmaking thing, right? So respect. And I have seen this where there are so many leaders on set 
that just don't show respect to people. I had just worked with the first AD a couple days or a couple weeks ago. She wouldn't even make eye contact with people. She wouldn't speak to anybody face to face. She uh, very passive aggressive. There was no respect for me as a person, just just as a person, just like hey, not even you know. Let's, and, and this is where a lot of the times you get ads who are just assholes, and and that is that bad rap for assistant directors where we scream, yell, and just we're assholes. And I hate that. Where I like to say that I'm pretty nice to work for. I don't know, like I like some people like working with me. You know what I mean? Like I I feel like I'm trying to change <laughs> the horrible image that assistant directors have, but. I leave from a place of respect, 100%. Like, whatever your job is, I have to respect you. First of all, I have to respect you because you're doing a certain craft that I, I can't do. <laughs> you're only going to tell me what time you need and how you're going to do it, what you need from me. Like, oh, do you need me to lock up the street so the crane can do, a, like, a 180 in the, in the street and then get on the sidewalk and then go up to the position it needs to be in? Or, you know, like, you – just like it just – I'm not pulling the fucking crane. <laughs> so for me, if you are in a certain department, like I have respect just because you have a certain skill that I definitely do not have. So I always go with that. Like I respect my background. Why? Because I don't want to be in the cold with like some crazy skimpy dress and it's like 30 degrees outside and you're out there for like six hours or something trying to shoot like a nightclub, like little line into like, you know, like this cute little building there. Everyone's like, oh my God, it's a little famous club. Everyone's like lined up. Like I, I respect background because they are working in conditions that I probably couldn't withstand. Like I'm telling them, hey, we're going to do this cross and this cross while they're like half dressed and I have like four layers on the cold like what and also actors like I don't em like I don't envy actors at all because their job is super hard they got to get super vulnerable they got to drop all the emotional guards that you've built up as a person they got to drop that to do like a crazy emotional performance so for me like every single person on a set pff, I respect them because also they have a number of things happening in their in their head that they have to do for the task at hand on set and also don't forget the personal life that you don't even think of do they have a wife a husband uh, a boyfriend that just broke up with them do they have kids uh, do they have a sick relative is their mom in the hospital it, did someone just get into a car crash a couple days ago did they just get a flat tire coming into like there are so many things that happen in life that you're like holy shit this person who is dealing with like trying to run a set or trying to run a team or trying to run the department or whatever. But then they have also that personal side that's like in the back of their head that they don't bring it to work, but also that is going to take a toll on them and give them some amount of stress, right? So you have to think about like people got lives. People got lives and they're trying to live them, but also they want to do their job too. I respect everyone 100%. Now I will even respect the assholes on set. I will. I will give it to them. That's the only way I, I feel like I can win them over. Please, I kill them with kindness, y'all. Just, just saying. <laughs> kill them with kindness. That's the only way I feel that when you are dealing with someone who's going to be an asshole to you, going to be rude to you, if I just stand my ground as far as like being confident, not being rude to them, being respectful of them, I, I feel like I win people over that way. Just, just out of just pure respect, honestly. <clears throat> All right, we got um, Jonathan the PA is on. Hello, hello. I don't know how long you're going to be here because you'd like hop on and hop back off, John. <laughs> uh, like, oh, throw a, uh, a rock and hand, hand your hands. That's annoying. <laughs> All right, so those are good leadership traits. And relating to film, sometimes they can be really hard to come by. I mean, we've all experienced horrible leaders on set, like 100%. Like, we've definitely experienced horrible leaders. And I guess they do have a place. They have a place because without those horrible leaders, and without those horrible le leaders leading me during my time on set, I feel like I wouldn't have known what not to do. So even the bad leaders have a place. And the good leaders do too, because they're like, wow, you really do this well. I want to be just like you. And then the bad leaders are like, okay, I don't want, I don't like how they did that. <clears throat> so this is what I won't do. So good ones, bad ones, they all have a place. They all have like some way of making it work for you in whatever style you want to use. So I'm going to get into styles a little bit. 
coaching, we talked about coaching a little bit. Coaching is a lot, I would say, focused on nurturing the strengths of each team member and working with them to get better. Now, this takes time. (laughs) I will say that this can be maybe a little little bit trying on those hard shows. If you have like a more laid back, well-oiled machine type show, you might be able to implement a coaching style because you have the time. You know, sometimes the coaching leadership style won't necessarily be your head of the department, but they're definitely gonna be your your like someone who might be second in command or, 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 or your third or whatever, right? And I think there is a place for coaching all in film because here's the thing is that you're going to hire that brand new green set PA. You're going to hire that new grip or someone who's new in the props department or, you know, you're going to have someone who is very, very new and you're going to have to actually train them. So coaching is going to be on set, but you have to have time to do that. You have to have time to train them. So coaching that style, very, it works very well but you have to have the time to do that. So just keep that in mind. Now, visionary, the visionary folks, this is your director 100% and your producers. The visionary style is, I would say they are going to be putting on like, for example, in the indie world, they're, they're putting on like a Kickstarter campaign or a GoFundMe campaign. They're raising funds. They're pitching their idea. They're trying to get um, their funds to make that movie or TV show or whatever. And they're like, this will raise awareness on this cause. And they have a vision of like how this project will impact the community. And the director obviously is going to be the visionary leader of the set. They are going to have a vision of how this story is going to be, you know, played out on screen, right? The only problem with the visionary is sometimes they do not pay attention to the details, the nuts and bolts of how to make that vision happen. And that's why you have other people who are like very much the micro and they are gonna get all the pieces in place and figure out how to make that vision happen, right? So the visionary, definitely your producers, your director, but not really, they see your big picture, but they they really can lose sight of like the nuts and bolts and how to make something go. Transformational is gonna be a combination. It's more like, uh, I would say, a little bit of the coaching, a little bit of the vision, because I think transformational, you have to have the vision of what you want to be, right? It's like the coaching is like, we want to make you better, but this is what we want to make you better into. So transformational is very, very good. Nicole also said that transformational is like her preferred style, where it's like, there, here's the goal. This is what we want to transform you into. And I've seen this um, I feel definitely seen this from season to season on a TV show where something on season one had a certain vibe, the overall very difficult, strict structure on season one. And they were like, you know what? Let's change some things. Let's change some key roles here, change some people. And for season two, this is the vibe that we're going to have a very transformational. Like they implemented a lot of decisions that helped change the vibe overall from season to season. But when that happens, some people are going to be let go. So that's the thing is that transformational sometimes, like if you're trying to transform your team, you will let go of the bad apples. You will let go of the people who are like definitely highly influencing your team in a bad way. And sometimes that will (laughs) be what is needed, unfortunately. So transformational, you're going to have to have some courage and some backbone to make sure you can fire those folks. So the servant leadership style is going to be more individual definitely want to make sure that they that their team members succeed on an individual basis it's like you know mentoring like more one-on-one a lot of time this this takes a lot of time to implement if you don't have a lot of time to implement this type of style this is not something you should be implementing (laughs) because some people can't you know a five minute training is not going to help this person really if you're trying to be like a servant type leadership style It doesn't really work in a time crunch. I will say that. So autocratic, this leadership style is one of the most common leadership styles in a film set. It is the my way or the highway. You do as I say and what, and like, don't ask any questions. It is very much, this is the plan. You do it. This is Mizuki style. (laughs) 
<laughs> Musuki, this is going to be your style. So autocratic is like, you do as I say, don't ask any questions. You just do what I need you to do. And this is a no bullshit style. This is definitely, um, you know, it is very much the way that ADs were running their sets for a very long time, how director photographies are running their team a lot of the time, um, th for decades. Um, a lot of the time it, w film sets were run this way. Now, a close second to the most common style run on set is bureaucratic, right? Now, this style is, they'll ask you about suggestions on what should change. They'll ask you for your opinion, but if it is too outside the norm, they will not implement those changes. So we'll ask you what you would, what you think should change, or maybe they'll put a suggestion box out there somewhere. They'll give you like a little, like just a little carrot and then nothing will come of it. Uh, if it's too left field or too outside the box, then it will not get implemented at all. So bureaucratic is, it's very much, they love the chain of command. They love the hierarchy system. There is a lot of making sure you do as you're told if your boss has told you to do that thing. And because I'm your boss or because I'm your leader, you do as I say. So autocratic is like very much like bureaucratic and I will, but they're very much into the, the chain of command. And I will say on film sets, chain of command is definitely a thing. And some people implement this style more than others on film sets where I've seen, for example, with you have a first, you have a second AD and you have a second, second AD where if you're using the chain of command correctly as a PA, you would go to your second, second first. Right. And then if you know, you talk to them, then that second, second will go to the key second. And then that key second will bring up the problem to the first if it needs to. You go up the chain. So very rarely on some shows will you have like a set PA coming up to a first AD. And the first AD will be like, why is this PA talking to me? And I have seen that where you are not, you are not expected to talk to the higher up. But then on other sets, it's like, no, I want my, you have a more open, like, communication. If you have a question, you come straight to me as a first, or you come straight to me as a second. Don't be afraid to talk to any of us, you know? So it all depends on the style and bureaucratic. It's more like you go in, in, in that style and like, keep that in mind for like trying to like, just observe your, uh, you know, leaders and observe how they're kind of what their style is. And then you're gonna be like, okay, so I shouldn't go above this person. I need to go to, I need to follow the chain of command because I'm going to piss someone off. You know, sometimes you have to, sometimes you need to go in order of whatever the chain of command is. <clears throat> All right. We have some, some comments here. Let's see. <clears throat> I'm starting to lose my voice. So this <laughs> live stream is going to be coming to a close very soon. <clears throat> oh my goodness. Okay, we got, um, Nicole, I try to be aware of another person's energy. Sometimes I can tell you how to approach a person or if you should approach that person that day. True, that's very true, what mood they're in. But sometimes you, you have to talk to them no matter what the mood is. <laughs> like for me as a first or a second second and I have to talk to the director and they're pissed off, I'm like, I know you're mad right now, but I need to know this information. <laughs> like unfortunately it doesn't always go, like you have to talk to them no matter what mood they're in, but uh, Jonathan, the PA, I'm leaving soon because going back to a hotel for early calls. See, like, so, yeah. So, Jonathan, you're always, like, in and out. But I'm glad you joined me for this amount of time. Thank you so much. Okay, so the pace setter leadership style. The pace setter, I have implemented this style a little bit. It depends what type of projects I'm working on when I'm a first. Is I'll tell people, like, hey, by this time, I want to be done with this scene. I have given you a goal. I've given you a time, basically. I want to be here at this point. And then we want to be here at this point. It's like very results driven, making sure that there are go little goals along the way. Uh, could be in the day, could be in a week, could be a whole month or whatever. So pace setting is not exactly has anything to do with like any emotions, strengths of people or whatever. Really, it doesn't, I mean, it's all about like results, basically. So I will say as a first, this is good for me because if, if I say, hey, I wanna wrap by midnight and, and I'm like, okay, we need to be on this scene by this time. 
And if we keep going, we keep going and we wrap on time, pff, everyone's happy, right? Everyone's like, yes, well, we wrapped on time. But and like if we're, we're ahead of the game and I, we keep chipping away certain more and more minutes and we're ahead of our results, our pace, we're ahead of our pace that we're trying to have for the day. And then we wrap early, 15, 20, half an hour, an hour early, everyone's happy. So the only time really it gets into the, the pace setter style kind of taps into any type of emotion is when people are like happy with the results. <laughs> Otherwise, everyone's like, we didn't make it. <laughs> so people are happy with the pace setter type leader if they make if they like make their goals, basically. So laissez-faire, like, okay, for my history, my government uh, history classes and whatever, anyone who's like an into type of government, you know, styles. So laissez-faire is like a hands-off approach. Very relaxed, let things run the way they go. There's no type of regulating, no micromanaging. Let's see how it works. <laughs> now, I will say I have worked with ADs like this. I have worked with, you know, producers that are like this. And I don't like it. <laughs> I like to have a leader on set that's going to be hands-on, regulating things. Doesn't have to be strict. Doesn't have to be like, you don't have to be an asshole, but like, I, I need you to have some type of, you know, interaction. I need you to be involved in some way. Last I fear doesn't really work with me. I don't like it. Some people love it because then they are able to be able to work without supervision. And some people can definitely work without supervision. Some people can't. Some people need a more hands-on approach. Some people need to be kind of steered and guided in the right direction. And other people who laws I fear, they're like, Phew, great, he's not telling me what to do? Great, finally. So what I will say about your team with laissez-faire style is laissez-faire might work with some and not with others. So if you decide to be very, let's just say you're more autocratic, like do as I say, this is what you're gonna do and how I want you to do it, but if you have a trusted person on your team that doesn't need any handholding, they don't need to do the thing that you want them to do the way you want them to do it, you can say, you can have like a more hands-off approach with that person, you know? So you can implement certain styles with different people on your team. Some people are not gonna be wanting to told what to do all the time. Some people will want to be told what to do. So I guess the lesson here is to make sure that you don't just have one type of leadership style over your entire team all the time. So democratic, moving on to the next style, democratic leadership style is gonna be, you're gonna ask folks, what do you think of this? Do you think we should do this? We're gonna vote on this change. Now, democratic doesn't always work in film because it takes too long for people to decide. This is where a lot of cooks in the kitchen get involved. And I'm sure you've seen like a, Producers are getting together and they're all like, what should we do? What should we do? Let's do this. Let's do this. What do you think? What do you think? Oh my God, someone please just make a decision. So Democratic, I don't really like. There needs to be like three people in a room that make this decision and implements the, the plan. That's what I like. So if it gets too Democratic and it gets too wide open, then you get nothing done. Nothing gets decided. Nothing gets implemented. It's just like, everyone's just like, oh, we were trying to figure out this thing and then nothing changes or nothing gets better. Nothing, nothing is achieved basically. So democratic is, I think my least favorite. I, I mean, I do want the thoughts of my team, but I can't make it a whole, what was that, that town hall meeting. I can't be there for hours and hours and we're going to debate this back and forth. I can't do that. So I think there is a time and place, like maybe there might be, couple of meetings you have. Hey, we've took your thoughts into consideration and we're going to do this. Where I feel like that might be a little bit more bureaucratic. Uh, but democratic is probably too long of a process for my liking in the world of film. So with the last one, transactional, and I read this one and I was kind of, when I researched all of this for my blog post that I have on my website, I was surprised that transactional is a big piece of how I lead my team and I had no idea that's how I did it. <laughs> so with transactional, it's if you do good, I will reward you. If you don't do good, I will reprimand you basically. So when I was working on Day of the Fight, this boxing movie in January, d d like December, it was sort of like, yeah, December, January, it was weirdly after Thanksgiving, whatever, it was like a few, a few weeks into January. Uh, and I 
did this thing where if the the sapiers or whoever they if they did something that wasn't exactly their job they went over and above and they did something great that didn't they, they didn't have to or maybe they just killed that thing that i was like i they have this task they didn't have to be told and they just they just did well i would give them gold stars it's so stupid when i when i say it out loud it's so stupid but like everyone loves getting gold stars guys I love getting gold stars and I love giving them. <laughs> so in the, in my little PA thread that I had with the PAs, I would, I would just be, I would put their name and a gold star next to it for, and they didn't know what it was for, but like I might've saw something that they did and they don't know that I was watching them, but I gave them a gold star, <laughs> like going above and beyond whatever their tasks were, or just being on top of it and like hopping in and without me having to tell them something like taking that initiative. But if something went wrong and I had to give them feedback, I'd be like, you know, I had to like tell them what they did wrong and be like, hey, for next time, this is what you do. Very transactional. There's not really a lot of motion in that. So I feel like my preferred leadership style is definitely going to be coaching and transactional. I have like the bookends. <laughs> I have coaching and transactional, like mostly is my my leadership style. and And I liked researching this because of like figuring out like where you fall on the scale and figuring out like what you could implement and like reading into all these things. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I, I want to like take a piece from this and I want to take a piece from this. The best way for you to lead is to kind of look at your team, look at the goals you have and make sure you're like kind of molding your style to them and like yourself and them and like what is there in front of you. I think having one over stylistic leadership approach is not gonna be the answer. A combination of them is gonna be the best way to go about it. I think for me, I wanna make sure that I am paying attention to the individual, how to make them better, training them, to making them feel empowered, making sure I'm using their strengths and I'm putting them in the right spots, but also I wanna reward them when they do good and I wanna make sure I'm giving them the feedback for when they mess up or when they you know, they, they need that feedback and they need to improve. So that's my type of style. I don't know where anyone else falls. So <clears throat> I go to the chat really quick before I wrap this up. Let's see. Mizuki, no BS style has a lot to do with my martial arts background. I'm glad that I joined this live. Definitely influenced me to work on empathy. <laughs> Thank you, Mizuki. Oh my God. This is great. Um, now I know that Mizuki can like kick my ass at the same time. This is why we love Mizuki. <laughs> <laughs> Rob Tierney, Gold Star is a great way to inspire and create a healthy community within your well, your PAs. This is funny because I thought it was really dumb to implement my Gold Star system, but I'm like, I just wanted them to know really simply that they did great at something. And it's really weird because one time they're like, Amber, you get Gold Stars. And I was like, yes. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I can. Like, for them to give me Gold Stars, I was like, I've won. <laughs> I feel like I've just won life. So... Thank you so much for joining me about like just nerding out on leadership. I know this is kind of like outside the box of some of the other things I cover, but leadership is very important on a film set. And I just, I just love dissecting leadership and how to really just implement all the different styles and how to get better and just, ah, I just love it. I just nerd out. So a couple of things happening with me. I have a, I have the, office PA series coming up. I'm going to be currently editing that. <laughs> I interviewed the ladies, um, Jennifer and Galana from Keys of the Production Office. So I have those videos coming out. If you want to know about being an office PA, a production coordinator, the production office, you know, what to kind of look for as far as like your attributes and your characteristics to be a better office PA, all the, all the things. I'm covering the office. Now there was a huge gaping hole in my channel about <laughs> like, like, I always cover production and set stuff. So the office is never covered. And I feel like it's very, very mysterious. So I love the fact that they were able to collaborate with me and I was able to promote them in some way because I think that what they do is amazing as UPMs. They have so much experience. I was really glad that I got to interview them. So those videos will be coming out soon. I don't know what my next live stream is going to be. I have no idea. This has definitely sprung upon you guys today because I really, I miss kind of doing a live stream and connecting with you guys. Uh, also, my... My next class, my next CPA class is going to be May 13th and 14th. I am very, very excited for my next class. It is sold out, but if you want to get on the, the, the wait list, there's a chance you could be, I, 
I let people on the wait list in all the time because some people drop for some weird reason. I have no idea. But if you are trying to get on the wait list, there's still time for that. I have one week left. And uh, then we're going to be in a couple weeks. I'll be in my class. So um, this is for Mizuki and Nicole. If you're up here, I don't know if you're going to come up to New York. I mean, why not? Because Nicole is from Atlanta. I'm loving her spot. But um, my next uh, PA little BFS film, um, Beyond Film School alum get together will be after that class on the 14th. So Oh, I'm so excited for that class. Uh, other than that, I have a lot of things happening as far as like other classes. Um, Nicole, I don't know if I ever told you, but like they're trying to put together an Atlanta class. So here's hoping for that. So be on the lookout for the Office PA or the Production Office series. And yes, channel memberships are available. Thank you for joining my um, channel as a channel member, Amanda. I don't know if she's still with me, but thank you guys all so much for watching. And yeah, if you guys have any suggestions, on like what you want to see for live streams, please feel free to email me at beyondfilmschool um, at gmail.com. Happy to have your suggestions for another live stream. And uh, yes, good. So Amanda's still here. Great, great, great. <laughs> so thank you so much, guys. It's been really great. And thanks for nerding out <laughs> and listening to my, <laughs> my whole leadership spiel. Thank you so much. I shall see you guys next time.